Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. It's taken a little longer than expected to release this episode because we've been experiencing some technical difficulties. By technical difficulties, I mean that I left my laptop out in the rain and and it didn't quite make it. So, so that's that. But here we are, and better late than never, as they say, with a new episode. And I'm very excited because this week we're going to be discussing veganism. So this week I invite Nina Gehman on the show. Nina is a sociologist at Harvard, currently pursuing her PhD. Her dissertation is focused on a comparative study of veganism as a cultural practice in the U.S., France, and Israel. And she's also the president of the Harvard Vegan Society, as well as the program director of the Ivy League Vegan Conference and the founder of the community advocacy group Boston Plant-Based Millennials. Now, in this episode, we explore how veganism has evolved and transformed over time, how it's adapting to different cultural contexts around the world, and how also vegan is grappling with a growing popularity that is slowly but surely moving veganism into the mainstream. Now, we'll be exploring everything from how to define veganism, which is definitely a a loaded, slippery term, to veganism's roots in both Eastern and Western philosophies, uh, veganism's relationship with religion, and also how veganism is understood and is evolving differently across different cultures. We'll also be going into depth on Nina's work, so looking at veganism in the United States, in Israel, and in France, and how they differ across these different cultural contexts. And finally, we'll explore a common, widely held criticism of veganism, which is that regardless of its progress, it remains this elitist Western concept. It's just not feasible and realizable in the majority of places in the world. We finish off with a message from Nina to all you millennials out there on why the vegan cause is not just a worthy cause, but also a cause that's worth getting involved in and actively fighting for. Now, without further ado, I bring you Nina Gehman. Nina, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. It's my pleasure, Matteo. Thank you for having me. What I'd like to do over the next hour or so is kind of talk about veganism's journey into the mainstream, um, the way that veganism is emerging and evolving across different cultures around the world. Um, but before we get too, you know, detailed, let's let's start simple. Let's start with the basics and and let's start with, you know, what sounds like an easy question, right? Which is, you know, what is veganism? What is vegetarianism? But, you know, when you start to kind of look underneath, I think there's there's quite a lot to it. Absolutely. So veganism is, um, you know, in some ways has been related to vegetarianism historically because vegetarianism refers to not eating animal flesh of various kinds, whereas veganism refers to like um, it's essentially an ideology that includes, you know, um, following a diet that doesn't have any animal products in it, but it also can refer to like clothing that you wear and other kind of like activities that you participate in that would in some ways exploit animals or in some ways use animals. So um, actually the word vegan was was coined in 1944 um, by a person named Donald Watson, and he founded the British Vegan Society. And he kind of used the first and last letters of the word vegetarian and kind of constructed this word vegan to distinguish it from um, you know, lacto over vegetarians, essentially people who would still consume animal products, but not consume animal flesh. So, and it's a really confusing concept because a lot of people think of veganism as, you know, primarily to do with diet, but it's actually an ideology about like the ethics of objectifying animals or using animals in other ways. And so, you know, kind of baked into this notion of veganism because it's an ideology are these other ideas, like for example, speciesism, which is the idea that like, you know, certain animals shouldn't have rights because of like based on their species. So that's kind of related to, um, you know, like racism or sexism Mm -hmm. or the idea of like carnism, which is this idea created by Melanie Joy, which is, which is the notion that, um, that 
you know, the idea of eating meat is not something that's like, that's obvious that it's just something that's been normalized, but it's also an ideology. And so veganism is seen as kind of like an ideology in reference to carnism. So that's kind of one approach, like it's a sort of an ideology, but then there's this other dimension, which is the idea that it's plant-based. And so mm. plant-based refers primarily to, um, you know, dietary concerns. And so it's not necessarily vegan. That's where it's like the tricky part because plant, you could be plant-based, but not vegan as in you can eat primarily a 90% plant-based diet, but not be vegan necessarily. So like in French, for example, you have vegetarian, that's plant-based. Right. Whereas, you know, vegan is vegan. So that's why it's a little bit tricky. Like I personally refer to myself as a plant-based vegan, meaning I emphasize a sort of like healthy component of veganism, like in terms okay. of diet, but then also veganism is an ideology. So I'd like subscribe to the notion that like we shouldn't, you know, use animals in the way that we use them today if we don't have to. And then I'm also, you know, like a health conscious vegan because technically you can eat Oreos and French fries all day and be vegan, right? but not plant-based because it's like still processed food and junk food. So it is a really, really slippery term. And also, of course, it's tricky because it's got this sort of historical um, baggage associated with it, which mm. is like, it's kind of considered an illegitimate thing. And even myself, who had been vegetarian for 10 years before I became vegan, I always looked at vegans and kind of thought like, oh, okay, like those are the extreme people. And I'm right. like very normal because I'm vegetarian, you know, I'm sort of, I'm like sort of in between. So it is a really loaded term. Um, and it's a little bit tricky about what it refers to, but veganism, technically speaking, refers to an ideology around um, kind of trying to take yourself out of the consumption of animals in any form. And then plant-based refers primarily to diet, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, that's a lot to unpack there. That's um... a lot to unpack, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's definitely interesting that I think um, you know, like you mentioned, the majority of people will understand veganism as you know, a kind of plant-based diet. They won't necessarily look into kind of the, the larger philosophy behind it of being, you know, against animal exploitation in all of its forms and even beyond that, like you mentioned. Um, but even within that, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that I guess there's still debates as to what constitutes being vegan. I mean, I'm thinking specifically here about Jainism, for example, right? So kind mm -hmm. of Jainism, the religion um, in India, kind of, you know, related to Hinduism, where uh, you can't, for example, in its most extreme form, you can't even eat, you know, after sunset, um, you don't eat root vegetables, uh, you don't, um, yeah, you don't consume any of these products, you know, after uh, after dark, basically, because you can't, you can't be certain that you're not consuming in some shape or form, you know, insects, any, any form of animal life, right? So I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that even within extremism of 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 veganism you know in, in in inverted commas there's still a lot of debate there right i mean among vegans i guess absolutely this is one of the things that um you know any particular any community um that you could think of would have a lot of kind of disagreements within themselves it's just the nature of defining like certain principles by which people live and so there's going to be disagreements around the edges so, you know, veganism is no exception to that. Um, but specifically about Jainism, obviously, that's a religious practice. And, you know, I, it, in some ways, I think that they're, the beliefs in that system are similar to the ones there are, you know, for example, in Judaism or in Muslim faiths about like eating certain animals versus not others and how the animals are slaughtered and so on. And so it's funny because this question of like, extremism also has this underlying notion that veganism in some ways is like religious or in some ways is like this practice that has this like religious undertones like first and i i could definitely see the argument for that because you know you can see it as a form of secular religion actually because you could see it as like something that has moral principles and then behaviors attached to those principles mm. and um but I think I mentioned last time we talked about um, Yuval Noah Harari and his book Sapiens, which is like a um, personal, huge fan of, of the way that his mind works. And and I actually had the pleasure of asking him in person um, about because he's practicing being himself. So I was very curious about his argument about the notion that there's, you know, humanity tells each other stories and we can see religion or money or capitalism or veganism and all these kinds of things we could see that as all like socially constructed things and that anything really can be a religion depending on how we define it right. and so i asked him about his definition and he said you know for me veganism is not a religion because i think something is religion if you know it explains the cosmic narrative so for example if 
it is something that's very extreme for you. Like, like I see, I mean, maybe I seem a little bit contradictory by being vegan, but not thinking of myself as extreme, but I think that it's important to kind of always question whatever principles you're following. And so, you know, I would love to, to consume in a way that, you know, harm, like does the least harm possible, but it's not, you know, blind faith in the sense that I'm perfectly aware that I could eat vegan all day, but then wear clothes that are produced by children in, you know, in like sweatshops in somewhere in Asia. And that's not ethical either. So, um, I mean, maybe those, you know, other, like those kinds of principles I'm sure are embedded in religion too. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, I think veganism is slightly different because, um, at least the way that I try to practice it in the sense that, you know, I kind of agree with Yuval Harari who said it's like, like, it's like a pain reaction. So, you know, he sees what happens in the dairy industry. He sees that as exploitative. He just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Right. And so he doesn't partake in it, but you know, it's not like he's never ever going to make exceptions under any circumstances possible. Like if he's really in a difficult situation, like maybe he will make an exception and be vegetarian one day or like, you know, there's some practicality embedded as well. Um, and so you can always argue about where the margins are and like what's actually ethical versus not. And you brought up the example of like insect eating versus honey. So there's right. always going to be debates. Um, but I do think that it's distinct from religions in that sense, like that it's not sort of um, it's based on kind of notions around practicality. And I and I also like I really advocate for skept- what I call skeptical veganism, which is always questioning like whether it actually makes sense because there are days when I think like, okay, like there are certain things that don't actually make sense. Like for example, um, you know, I could, I could conceive of a world in which we consume some animal products if we live in total symbiotic kind of existence with animals, which is what we've done throughout humanity's history. It's just not the reality anymore. So when people say like, okay, I'm going to follow a paleo diet, like in some ways I kind of understand their argument in the sense of like, you know, we have eaten meat throughout most of human history, but the amount of meat and the type of meat we've eaten throughout history is so different from today. Like no one's like eating animals that were like wild animals that exactly. they hunted and then like ate every six months or something like that. It's just not the reality. So I think of my veganism as like a very specific response to the specific conditions of today. Like as a sociologist, I'm really uncomfortable about kind of making these like objective kind of like claims about yeah. like this is the right way because this is the I think in many ways this is the right way for who we are who I am in the particular like elite position that I am in the world you know so I think it's always like you have to be question you have to question all these things I think religion for the most part doesn't um promote the questioning of things and of course mm. maybe maybe it does like maybe I'm personally not religious so can't really speak to that but I do think any kind of ideology that doesn't um promote questioning or skepticism is inherently problematic yeah and that doesn't adapt i guess to kind of the the practicalities and i, I like that idea that you know as a, as a kind of skeptical vegan that you're you're in many ways just responding to you know the the reality at hand and that and that you know you're and we'll get into this later but this idea of you know veganism um as a res- you know as a as a practical response to kind of a lack of resources and 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 to the kind of industrial you know um agricultural system that we have now and so i can see very much there that that kind of can distinguish it at least from religious dogma right this idea that you know you yeah. unquestionably stay vegan regardless of circumstance and you know you don't question it no matter what the evidence states yeah, and I, I should underline, though, that it's still primarily for me ethical. Like, I think, you know, first and foremost, it is a moral choice for me. I just don't want to participate in a system that, you know, exploits animals and objectifies them in the way that we do today. Um, I, that's not to say, though, that I can't imagine a world in which animal animals play some kind of small part in, the, you know, the human drama, just like they have throughout history. But again, it is still primarily ethical choice for me. And as someone who, we'll talk about this a little bit later, we'll touch on sort of the notion of elitism, but as someone who has the resources and the ability to do it a hundred percent, I see it as like a, almost like a moral duty to do it a hundred percent because I have the ability. And so for me, it's just a matter of convenience and taste and habit than it is really about anything else. So I, you know, there are people who legitimately cannot do it a hundred percent around the world. And so I see myself as somebody who kind of compensates for those people in some way. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I think it'd be good actually if we if we maybe take take a, a step back and kind of look at because um, I think this is fascinating and this will kind of help explain 
um, the evolution of veganism, which we'll get mm -hmm. into more later. But if we if we take a step back and we look at the origins and, and the kind of history of not only veganism, which we briefly touched upon, but vegetarianism in general and the kind of umbrella term that vegetarianism is, right? So, I mean, the first thing for me that comes to mind um, is kind of the religious side of it, not only... Um, you know, as we touched upon in, in, in Jainism and in Hinduism in India and even in Buddhism and this kind of principle of nonviolence uh, and, and reincarnation, but also, and I think this is this is fascinating, I, I definitely didn't know this before, um, been doing a bit of research on this, but kind of the, you know, it's, it's connection to Christianity and, 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 and Christianity's role as, you know, humans having this dominion over animals being very central to Christianity and therefore, you know, um, not an antithesis, but but kind of setting itself apart from vegetarianism and and and, and veganism. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm actually I personally became vegetarian because of the principle of ahimsa, the idea of nonviolence toward all living things. Um, I started to practice yoga, like the sort of full practice of yoga, like postures as well as like philosophy and so on when I was 15. And this principle made a lot of sense to me. And it's, it's, it's obviously central to Hinduism. And as you mentioned, you know, this kind of, I mean, religion is, you know, thoroughly cultural, as far as I'm concerned, as a sociologist, you know, it's something that um, it's a set of principles that gave people sort of answers to the biggest questions we always ask, like humans have an inherent need to search for meaning. And so it is actually really interesting what you mentioned about um, how particular religions can kind of like, gear us towards certain treatment of animals. And it's true what you say about Christianity, but there's also a, there's a really good book called um, Culture and Activism by Elizabeth Cherry. She's a sociologist in the U.S. who's primarily known for her work on animal rights. Mm -hmm. And there is actually a lot of Christian organizations in the U.S. in particular that, that actually draw the opposite link, that they think that there's a lot of scripture evidence that Christianity actually promotes like kind of um, – living in harmony with other animals. And so I think the issue there, it's a little bit tricky because you can, there are definitely books on how there's just sort of inherent inequality against animals, just like there's inherent inequality against like women in a particular religions. Right? right. So I just think in general, there tends to be this notion that, you know, that there are like subhuman people and whether they were people of different races historically, mm. or it was women or it was animals for the most part, like a lot of religions throughout history have had those kinds of principles embedded within them. I actually don't think that that's necessarily separate for um, some, like sort of, I think Hinduism and Buddhism is seen today as like very nonviolent religions. And that's in many ways true. But I also I think a very Western interpretation in many ways. Right. Um, so I think it's tricky. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on a religion, but that's my personal perspective. I think that, um, you know, different Obviously, religions are sets of social norms in a given society, and so they're like, you know, if they if they have certain assumptions, people might interpret them the way that they want to. I guess is what I would say about religion. Yeah, and I think what's interesting as well, and and, and kind of aside from religion, uh, but particularly in the West, I think is that early Western vegetarians, you know, they were called Pythagoreans, and, and that kind of idea that it wasn't necessarily just. Because a lot of people tend to think that you know vegetarianism ism only originates from kind of you know Hinduism and from the east and and this idea of nonviolence but there was at least a movement that kind of started with you know Pythagoreans in 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 the west and then and then later also I think a lot of philosophers in the 17th and 18th century especially after kind of you know meeting and and, and this kind of reinforced I think a lot of their beliefs but um after after meeting you know kind of um you know, discovering in in inverted commas uh India you know, there, there was a lot of interest in vegetarianism, not just from a religious perspective, but very much from a, a scientific perspective, you know, the scientific revolution, the fact we kind of started to understand that animals had nervous systems. I mean, all of that is, is, is very interesting. It is really interesting about it. it I mean, all of it really is kind of um, hovers around this notion of sentience and sort of how whether other you know, other animals can feel in the way that humans feel. And there's this like notion that if they can feel it the way that we can feel, if they can suffer, then they also deserve not to suffer, just like humans deserve not to suffer. Um, I think it's really interesting. I mean, it's funny because animal rights activists, they definitely think of animal rights as inalienable, just like, you know, we think of human rights as inalienable. And, you know, I teach a, a course on sociological theory at Harvard, and 
whenever I talk to my students about social norms and I sort of question like whether we think of human rights as inalienable, people get really kind of uncomfortable because, you know, that's, it's obviously a concept that's well accepted among, you know, like primarily education, like elite educational institutions. And like, I mean, most of the world actually now, I think, um, especially since World War II. Um, But it's funny because then people don't necessarily think of that way about animal rights. And so I just always ask them to question like, you know, one is not obviously different than the other. And like that, well, I mean, that brings up different questions, right? So like thinkers throughout history have seen this in different ways. And, um, but I do think a lot of vegetarians love to point out that many of like the great thinkers throughout history have been vegetarianism at one point or another, like you mentioned Pythagoras, but also like, especially at the end of their lives, like Leo Tolstoy, for example, Mm. or Albert Einstein, or uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and um, so people, they love to point, or like Bernard Shaw, so people love to point that out, that like, at one point or another, I mean, it's unclear exactly what the diet consisted of, it was probably more vegetarian than vegan, but, you know, so. Exactly, you'll see those 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 memes pop up all over the internet yes. of the, the one <laughs> quote of Albert Einstein talking specifically about animals, or, no, but I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely something, you know, that's also very interesting, the fact that you know, across history, across time, across cultures, um, there's always been this kind of return to that question of eating meat and its role that it plays, you know, within society. Um, and on that note, I think I recently read a book by um, Tristram Stewart called The Bloodless Revolution, which is, um, you know, goes very much into the history of vegetarianism. And one thing that stuck out for me particularly is, you know, his belief that, uh in the 1840s, when you know vegetar- the word vegetarian was was coined, and you had the formation of vegetarian society seven years later, you know, for him that was very much a defining moment. Um, not necessarily in a positive sense, you know, for him it was the biggest strategic error that vegetarians made in the sense that before it was much more of a a discussion, an issue that was engaged with, uh, you know, by by all members of society, and and now by the fact that. You know, it's increasingly being seen as this kind of separate group. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you're a vegetarian or you're like not. Like an identity you, group. Right, exactly. And, and the fact that as it's been to labeled. Issue. Mm, yeah. it's, you, can, you know, you can pigeonhole it. It closes off the bait. Um, it's only interesting to people inside that particular pigeonhole. And, 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 and it kind of becomes a separate issue. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I still haven't gone to that book. I have a whole stack of books on the history of vegetarianism. Um, but I haven't read that one in particular. But... I think that's a really interesting point because um, this sort of notion of siloing of a particular movement is something that I'm personally really concerned with as, you know, a movement member, because I think that, I mean, that I think I would have come to veganism personally a lot earlier if I didn't think of it as like a separate identity, right? Right. And so in some ways you can think of, you know, because one of the questions that I'm trying to answer my dissertation is really is veganism really a social movement because it doesn't target the state in the way that traditional social movements have kind of tried to get political responses to their issues. Um, and it's not necessarily in contrast to the market either, which is tends to be also a feature of social movements. It's actually something that has worked very well with the market. You know, vegan products have come out and, um, it's not really necessarily a recognition movement like the gay, gay and lesbian movement, for example. Um, so in some ways, you know, it's like a social movement, like an identity movement, like, you know, civil rights or feminism or the LGBTQ movement. Mm -hmm. So in some ways it has those attributes where it's like an identity movement. Um, and that there's these claims for recognition, but on the other hand, I think that the movement strategy is very much more about targeting like all of humanity, because really the arguments that are used are that it's, like the the three pillars of veganism are really like health, environment, um, and ethics. And that is something, those things apply to everyone. It's not like, you know, you, which is interesting because it's a movement, but what it really wants is not necessarily recognition for the people who self-identify as vegan, but it's, it's in many ways like a conversion or sort of like a trying to get people to kind of come into the movement to, to right. come into the fold, even if they don't go self-identify vegan. as vegan, right, go vegan. But even if people don't self-identify as vegan, vegans really want them to kind of, you know, consume vegan products, for example, and mm. be more open-minded to like move toward veganism. And of course, I'm, my dissertation is about comparing how this is done across your country. So it's done a little bit differently in each place, but it is interesting because, uh, you know, this movement only stands to gain if more people kind of like are open-minded to it. And, you know, are actually willing to 
do it to some extent, even if they don't do it perfectly, if that makes sense. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I just wanted to touch upon that. Yeah, that idea that kind of the the birth of the, the modern collective societal image of veganism and, and kind of especially its roots in, and we touched upon this, but in, in animal rights, uh, in ethics, mm-hmm. uh, which I guess is kind of where it started, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, what comes to mind for me is, is kind of PETA activism and, and, and the role that that had in in. I guess in, in, in with animal rights, but I guess also with veganism and kind of making it known to the public, but like we said, not necessarily in the best light and that it was very much attack, uh, attached to extreme extremism and activism. So could you maybe talk a little bit about kind of PETA and the animal rights movement and, 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 and its association with veganism? Sure, absolutely. So um, it's a really interesting notion because veganism undoubtedly was born out of the animal rights movement. So Cherry, for example, shows us in her work very clearly that, um, you know, in the 1980s and, um, sorry, 1980s, 1990s, when there were already animal rights organizations founded, right? So you mentioned like the vegetarian societies, there were vegetarian societies, which kind of included people who cared about animal issues, but it was primarily sort of focused on diet and, um, you know, certain ethical and moral principles, but there wasn't sort of like they weren't social movement organizations in the sense that they were trying to like actively use like, you know, different facets like protesting and stuff like that to, con- to convince people to go vegan or vegetarian. So when they act- the, when those kind of social movement organizations, PETA being the most kind of um, uh, famous, notorious, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, um, primarily the issues they were focusing on. So these are social movement organizations, issues such as spur, vivisection and other types of issues that, um, you know, were absolutely ethical issues, but they tended to focus on a prim- on minority of animals that were used by humans. So you know, it was like animals are experimentation. And a lot of people could identify with that, you know, in some ways people saw that as extreme, but in other ways people saw that as like they, they kind of understood sort of the approach that they were taking. But it was when the, when there was this realization that actually the primary, primarily the animals used by humans are farmed animals in factory farms. And these factory farms are really starting to open up at, during that period. So, you know, since world war two in the U S so it was then that like the animal rights shifted, animal rights activists shifted towards vegetarianism and then over time to veganism. Um, and so I think it's interesting because, you know, the images we have of protesting of kind of, um, and sometimes make maybe maybe violent protest that we tend to associate with animal rights, mm. but then veganism we don't necessarily associate with that anymore as much. Like there tends they, over time, there's almost like this decoupling of veganism from animal rights. And I should maybe say explicitly more that it's a decoupling between plant based and animal rights because veganism is still kind of like this in between phase where it's like a little bit has one foot in the animal rights world and one foot sort of in the diet yeah. plant based world, and it's kind of like this transitionary thing. And so I think depending on where you are, so in the US, I think veganism is not necessarily associated with animal rights anymore. Whereas if you go to France or you go to Israel, which Mm. is what I did for my research, the two are much more linked together. So if you're a vegan, you tend to be an animal rights activist. They tend to go hand in hand. And let's say you meet somebody who's vegetarian in France that will like very much emphasize they're just vegetarian. They're not, they're just like plant-based. They're not actually an an animal act, an animal activist. Whereas in the U S a lot of people will just say they're vegan and not have to feel like they have to qualify with, I'm not actually an animal rights activist. I just eat like a plant-based diet. So that means that there's this like coupling in the imagination of like the French people that I talk to for the most part that there isn't as much in the U S. Um, so I think that this, and it's unclear to me yet in my dissertation, whether this is like, you know, just a natural sort of like sort of a progression of a movement. So for example, a lot of people will say like, oh, the vegan movement is an elitist movement, which is undoubtedly true in many ways. But then if you look at a lot of other movements like civil rights movement or the feminist movement or the gay rights movement, all those movements were spearheaded by elites because these are the people who had influence, these people who had money, these people who had power. And so it's those people that actually like started to, you know, promote a movement and then eventually kind of trickle down to where the masses more. And so it's possible that we're just like in the beginning stages of the vegan movement. And that, so it's like primarily led by elites and then eventually mm. it will kind of trickle down and that, you know, this like cultural delay with, you know, France and Israel kind of being a little bit later in terms of adopting this decoupling 
that is a question I'm going to try to answer in my dissertation. But as I mentioned, I have more questions than I have answers at this point. So if you interview me in no, a year, <laughs> I, have <more> answers. <laughs> I have more answers. That's so. super interesting. Um, I definitely want to get into your research uh, in more detail in a bit. But before we do, um, you know, we were touching on this idea of expanding the kind of core ideological tenets of veganism and that it started off very much with animal rights movements. Now, uh, especially in the US, like it, it, you like you mentioned, it's starting to decouple. And, you know, like you said, what really comes to mind is the, the plant based health reasons for going vegan, which is, you know, super, super popular now. So, I mean, where did that kind of, I guess, like we said, that has its historical roots too, but maybe focusing on the US where it's, it's more pronounced, how, how did that kind of come about and, 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 and where's that heading? So I don't know if I have a uh, specific answer to that question because it's something that I'm trying to answer in my dissertation as well, like where did it actually come from? Mm. But it seems clear to me that this notion of healthism, like this like obsession with kind of like health related things is much more just in general popular in the U.S. And it tends to be something that's very consumerized in the U.S. as well. Mm. And so we can see vegan kind of going hand in hand with things like paleo or gluten-free or these other kinds of movements, like these other kinds of um, um, sort of food, re- like diet related movements, I guess. Um, and it's interesting that because vegans, a lot of vegans will be very upset by this because they think of it as an ideology and they don't think of yeah. it as like in line with gluten And that you just said you know, veganism free. in line with paleo, you know, like, you know, just associating paleo diets, which is very much associated, you know, with protein and meat eating with, with veganism. But that's so true. I mean, sorry to interrupt, but just, you know, that, that idea that veganism in certain cultures or in certain contexts is closer to paleo diets than is to other things because, you know, the kind of health you know, the, the health. Oh, I mean, it's even close in the sense of like that what they both share is an emphasis on fruits and vegetables, which mm. for the most part, standard American diet does not include. So the standard <laughs> American diet actually does not include a lot of fruits and vegetables. So in that sense, they're at least, I mean, I personally believe that they're a little, it's, it's just a historically inaccurate diet. And so I think in many ways, it's like the, it's like a zombie version of the Atkins diet, essentially just like a new, new age Atkins diet. But <laughs> Um, that's my personal opinion, but at least in some ways, like it's based on something related to like fruits and vegetables, you know, like I think the whole like deleting grains portion of it doesn't really make a lot of sense from like my personal opinion, but I do see how veganism sort of can, it sort of encapsulated in this kind of like general trend toward healthism. Mm. And then also in the environmental, I mean, the environmental environmental movement has been pretty dominant in the U S for a long time. So, I mean, they're just enormous, enormous environmental costs to meet. And also, you know, modern, modern factory farming is like a huge contributor to like ocean dead zones. And, um, you know, so as we were mentioning about health, like it's related to, you know, diabetes, like basically all of the top leading killers in the U S like in terms of like these, um, diseases of of affluence, they're all related to diet. And if you ate a more plant-based diet, those would decrease. And in terms of environmental, like it's just huge in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, um, which are like, I mean, these are not, you know, there, there might be disagreements to some extent about whether like veganism 100 percent is good for your diet or for your health or, you know, like the exact numbers of how much animal rights, Mm. the, the animal agriculture industry affects the earth. But these are like, you know, huge numbers of like, you know, the U.N., United Nations. It's not like some random like fringe organization. Right. Like if the United Nations has explicitly, explicitly said like the animal uh, animal agriculture industry contributes to more more of a greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector combined, which is just enormous. And so it depends on how you count exactly. You know what the effect on water is. I mean, like deforestation of the Amazon. Like mm. you know, so it's just it's so enormous that it's whether people go vegan or not, it's kind of like, you can't, you can, you cannot ignore these kinds of like numbers. And so it's just like very, you know, cause a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, um, vegan activists that I talked to in my research will say, like, I asked them like, do you, like, do you see one day that we'll have a vegan future? And they'll have this very optimistic outlook and they'll say, mm-hmm. you know, like one day people will realize like how we mistreat animals and they'll wake up to this and then we'll like change things. And I really wish that I could be, kind of an optimistic vegan but I I tend to be and I don't know if this is like my like Russian fatalistic blood or something but I just 
like I just can't first like I just cannot conceive of a world in which yeah. we like wake up to this one day and prevent it like it's really just I mean I'm trying everything I can to contribute in my own mm. way to like getting people to think about this more but um it you know, there are just fundamental constraints in terms of like population growth and the amount of meat we're consuming like that at some point, we're just going to reach a point which in which I wish it's no longer sustainable. And so people won't go plant based because they necessarily want right. to They'll do it because of constraints. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's like, into it. you know, vegan lifestyles are kind of becoming a reality because they're enforced by the limits of, you know, our, our resources. And that's also very interesting is that it's kind of just um, and that has as as very much something I didn't know, but it has its roots very much in 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 set, you know early I think it was early nineteenth century utilitarians in in, in the UK mm -hmm. were already talking about you know mm -hmm. um, vegetarianism being um, you know they were promoting vegetarianism just because of the fact that they realized um, you know the kind of food conversion ratio. I mean I'm sure they didn't call it that back then, but the fact that animals are just you know feeding animals first and then eating animals is a very very inefficient way at the end of the day of of, of, of feeding you know uh, human beings and, and a growing world population it's it's inefficient and it's unethical in my opinion because it's a matter of food security and it's we don't have a you know we don't have a production problem we have a distribution problem like there is enough food to feed everyone including the two more billion people that are going to come by 2050 we just don't the way that it works is we feed animals with that food and then we like rich Westerners eat that food. And then people around the developing world do not even get access to that food. So, you know, this is, these issues are fun. To, this is the thing when I started my project, um, you know, my, my advisors were like very much like, this is the most niche topic. Like, how could you do this topic? But I just think this topic touches on absolutely everything. Issues of you know, public health, like huge public health crises, mm. environmental issues, like the planet literally dying before our eyes, like food, uh, food um, security around the world, developing countries. So, um, you know, I don't even know if it's really worth talking about. I mean, I, and I obviously, obviously ethical issues related to animals too, but it's, it's really, I mean, it doesn't really matter what people think about the ethical perspective of animals. Like I, you know, I hope we live in a world one day where, I don't know, my grandchildren will, you know, sneak out to like eat hamburgers because that's like totally unallowed and that's like they're doing drugs <laughs> in the future. And, you know, it's like totally looked down upon by everyone, by society to do these things. But these like rebellious teenagers will do this on the side or like, you know, like the way that they do drugs today. And it'd be nice to live in a society like that where that's like the social norm is to not eat animals. Yeah. Um, and I'm not really sure if we're going to get there because of these like constraints or we're actually going to get there because it'll be like a societal shift. Like, like I don't think anyone knows the answer to that question at this yeah. point. Yeah. I, I very much agree with you here about being a, a skeptic and a critic. Um, you know, first really before I'm a vegetarian, I'm very much critical or, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, but, <laughs> but that idea, um, you know, about veganism and the movement being more and more one that, that's about practicality and therefore also about trade-offs, right? So that, you know, veganism has its kind of ideological purities and, and a lot of vegans will, you know, will claim that it's, it's, it's all or nothing. But I guess in the future, are we kind of more and more heading towards uh, a situation in which veganism is experiencing, you know, these kind of ideological trade-offs? You know, you, you look at flexitarianism, reducitarianism, you know, climatarian diets, whatever you want to call it, there's a hundred names for it. But this idea that, veganism in a way is much more than just going completely um animal free it's very much about realizing that there's this practical problem that we're facing very much you know climate change and all that um and that it's very much about promoting people to go as plant-based as possible well i think the answer to that question is actually that it depends which is like a terribly annoying question answer that sociologists often give but it's because I think that um, that is undeniably the trend in the U.S., but I like I would be remiss to say that I don't necessarily think that's the case all over the world. So, for example, in Israel, it seems to me that um, people are, you know, it's the fastest growing vegan population per capita in the world. And the people that I talked to there, it seemed much more to be about animal rights explicitly and sort of and to some extent environment, but not really so much about health and this like boundary. Like people don't 
people are doing it for the sort of like the original ideological reasons that people did it in the past. Um, but that's less the case. That's less the case in the U.S. Like we do see a lot more of this flexitarianism, reducitarianism, climatarianism. So I think that that actually might depend on the particular institutions in a given society, particular cultural norms. Um, and I think, I think really we don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, I do know that within the vegan movement itself, there's a lot of disagreement about this. So some people really think that, you know, um, it's a matter of promoting a very specific set of principles and, uh, you know, it, it's the sort of the animal welfare versus the animal abs- absolutism. My personal perspective is that, you know, I definitely do it. I, I definitely sort of the, the message that I personally give as a vegan to others who are interested is that, you know, I do it because I think it's ethically wrong to treat animals in the way that we do today. But sort of the approach that I have in terms of all the projects that I have and things like that, they, I think, are more designed to kind of like get people to just think critically about what they consume. And that might not necessarily lead to full veganism, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. So, sense. so I don't know if it's about kind of, I think... I think in many ways it makes sense to promote reduction because I think that that sort of gets people at least interested as opposed to just sort of shutting down immediately, but not being kind of like remiss to mention the like, you know, the underlying principles. Yeah. And I know you're very much at the beginning of your dissertation, but, uh, and you mentioned that maybe, you know, in France and in Israel, um, I mean, one of the ways you can phrase it, I guess, is that they're uh, in inverted commas behind the U.S. and that the movement is still younger. And so it's it hasn't been decoupled yet from this animal rights movement. But I mean, what are kind of the, some of the reasons that you think, um, you know, both in France and in Israel and, and, and after that, we can we can touch upon other countries. Uh, but let's start with France and Israel. Why the focus there is still very much more on. I guess animal rights, or or, mm-hmm. or or not so much on the health aspect, and and why it's kind of yeah, why it's different across different uh, cultures. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I literally just started my dissertation, so I don't really know the answer to that question yet. Hopefully, in a year, I will have a definite, like more of a definite answer for you. But I think that we don't actually know whether this is a cultural delay or it actually is something about those particular two countries um, that I chose for my dissertation that there's something within those um, like certain institutional configurations or cultural reasons by which people kind of respond better to these ideas. So I think in many ways it has to do with like existing cultural perspectives. So in France, for example, um, like this notion of patrimoine culturel, so this idea that there's like kind of like cultural heritage. Mm. And of course, you know, a lot of French people look down on veganism and look at very much down on vegetarianism and veganism. They think of it as very extreme. Some might see it as more like this cosmopolitan U.S. cool thing to some extent now. But there's still this, for the most part, this kind of like view of it as this like very strange, extreme behavior that's like related to cults kind of thing. But at the same time, it really resonates with the idea of cultural heritage because, you know, factory farms are definitely very much against the notion of cultural heritage, right? So it's like this idea of small farms. So there's some things within that kind of refer back to that. So this idea that we shouldn't treat animals like the way that they are treated in factory farms might not lead people to necessarily go vegan. Some people might go vegan, but a lot of people might just say, oh, like, I'm definitely going to make sure I only buy from small farms now. You know, so it's kind of like a reversal back to how French people, so like sort of French food culture is around sort of local things, like doing things by traditional means, right? So it kind of resonates there. So they might, a lot of French people might think it's unethical how animals are treated in factory farms, but not necessarily think it's unethical how they're treated in small farms. Exactly. Right. So there's this like slippage between that. Um, In Israel, I think for the most part, it's quite similar, but obviously in Israel, you know, in every, in every, this is is why I sort of chose these three countries is because I think they're all really unique in their own way. So for example, in France, it's the notion of like militarism is never related to veganism in any way. But in Israel, because it's a highly militarized society, it's almost impossible to talk about veganism and not kind of talk, bring up the no, the fact that, for example, the Israeli Defense Force now allow, sort of provides vegan helmets, boots, and food for its soldiers. And a lot of people c- consider this vegan washing, this notion like mm. like pink washing or green washing, where the IDF will have like posters of like two gay men in the army, like wearing army clothes. It's kind of to seem like progressive. Mm-hmm. But with veganism, it's particularly interesting because it's an ethical movement against killing. Mm. 
And yet you have this like military, op- military <laughs> yeah. like operation that is like promoting and saying like you can be like a member of civil society and you can sort of, um, or a member of this like, you know, a, a Zionist, you can be like someone who's very pro-Israeli as yeah. well as someone who's like very ethical because you don't mistreat animals, whoever like actually did nothing at all. And there's this, um, Erica Weiss has written about this notion of decoupling of human rights and animal rights, like sort of seeing how, you know, attribution, attributions of blame, like if, if certain people or Palestinians obviously seen as, um, you know, having done certain harm against Israel, then they're seen as unethical, but then animals haven't done any harm like that. And right. so they are ethical. So it's just like this. So veganism, this is the thing. It might seem like a very obvious thing, like, okay, we don't eat animal products, but it's actually not because it's an ideology, then it's a diet, then it's a cultural practice that resonates with other cultural practices, resonates with other social movements. And then the way that it's kind of defined can very much vary. And the interesting thing about Israel too is that it tends to be supported both on the extreme right and the extreme left. So, for example, I lived in a okay. vegan commune when I was in Israel, and I lived with a bunch of like you know military defectors, people who did like who who went to jail instead of going to the military, who like served on kibbutzes instead of going to the military, um, and you know these people were very much on the extreme left and were definitely not pro Israel. I, it's some of them, right? Mm. Um, but then at the same time, you see these like very sort of like staunch religious promoters on the on the right. And certain like political, you know, groups seeing so so it's it's, it's interesting because it's the same cultural practice, but it can be kind of picked up on and sort of co-opted by different groups, and it could take on different meanings in different places. Um, and so, you know, in in the U.S., it's more of this kind of lifestyle movement yeah. where it's political activism to some extent, or or non-political at all, just through your consumption. And Israel can be more of this like political movement. So, it depends on the particular context. It's fascinating, especially I mean, I'm especially fascinated by 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 the Israeli context because I mean, the U.S. context is one that's kind of known in its in its broad terms. You know, is known quite well globally, and you know, and obviously live in France, but. Also in Israel, I mean, is there a connection historically between, you know, obviously the Holocaust and, and, and the association with that and veganism? And I mean, that's something that definitely pops to yeah. mind. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people think that, so veganism basically was as popular in Israel as it was everywhere else, like five years ago. And then there was um, this controversial activist named Gary Urofsky who came to Israel. Um, I think it was in 2010. So five years ago, I think. And um, he he makes this controversial comparison between um, the way we treat animals in factory farms and the Holocaust, because actually, in fact, some of the uh, gas chambers were built kind of based on the way that we killed animals mm. before that. Um, and so, you know, he calls it, you know, that there was this Holocaust, but the animal, what's happening to animals is actually like the animal Holocaust, which is yeah. still ongoing. Obviously, highly controversial. Some people thought he was ext- very extreme and said really inappropriate things, and other people resonate with that. And and um, so what happened is he actually gave a lecture um, at a U.S. college, and then it was translated by activists mm. in Israel into Hebrew. And a quarter of the Israeli population saw this this video, um, and it became like this like really hot topic, really a controversial quarter. topic. A quarter, a quarter of the population. I mean, it's a small country, but <laughs> still a quarter of the population. And when I was there, I mean, like there were many so-called Gary Urofsky vegans, like people who saw it three years ago or whatever and decided to go vegan because they resonated with it. So, you know, I think the Israeli case is, I mean, I, I was originally going to do the U.S. and France, and then I thought I have to add, add Israel because it's the most like bizarre and unique case because mm. it's a very small country. It's a Middle Eastern country. It's got that Mediterranean cuisine element, obviously very militarized component. Yeah. And then also there's this like sort of, uh, some have called it like a Messiah figure um, component of Gary okay. Rossi, which is just not the case in the US or France. You can't. And by the way, it's really interesting because when you talk to people in France, almost no one mentioned Gary Rossi. A lot of people have mentioned Melanie, Melanie Joy because her book mm about carnism was translated in France. And so a lot of people read that book, but almost no one mentioned Gary Rofsky. So that's why I just keep thinking that you can't study a culture practice in just one society because you're going to make conclusions about it that might only be specific to that society. Definitely. So that's why I'm trying to really do these three cases because they're all vastly different. So That makes a lot of sense. Um, beyond these cases, beyond these three cases, I mean, this is something... Um, I'm thinking particularly here now about the developing world. So looking at a kind of non-Western 
uh, perspective of where veganism might go glo- in a truly global sense. Because one, I think one of the problems I have as a, a skeptic here is that, and we touched upon this briefly in the beginning, is this idea of elitism, right? Is this idea that veganism at the end of the day is only for the privileged, is only for those that can afford it, is only for those that have you know, the, the time for it, however you want to phrase it. Um, and so, you know, what do you think about, you know, veganism and its prospects in developing countries and, and yeah, just this whole idea of veganism being truly global rather than just Western elitist. Mm -hmm. So let me touch on this notion of elitism first, and then I'll jump into talking about developing countries, which I should say, I don't know a lot about, um, because I don't have any developing countries in my dissertation, but can sort of just speculate as a, as a person who's in the vegan movement, I guess. Um, just as, I just find this notion of elitism so interesting as a sociologist because veganism has always been evaluated negatively. You know, so in the past it was, you know, like it's about cults, it's about it's extremism, it's violence, it's et cetera, et cetera, like weirdness. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, oh, it's like it's it's prissy, it's upper class, it's elitist, it looks down on people. And so I just find it really interesting because it's like negative, but it also has got this like I, you probably know Pierre Bourdieu's work on like taste, right? So it's this notion that it has got this yeah. like bourgeois element. Definitely, yeah. And it's so interesting because, you know, it's still a negative evaluation, but whenever something is elitist, it's also something that's like by sort of by definition desirable mm-hmm. because essentially elitism is related to scarcity. When something is hard to get, um, then it becomes more of a, like an, a marker of elite status. And so it's actually really interesting that for the most part throughout history, the people who were de facto vegan <laughs> were people who could not afford meat because it was a symbol <laughs> of elitism. Like it was, it was not elitism of, of being high status and people would eat, you know, meat like once a year on like the wedding or the festival or whatever it was. And so essentially people were plant-based. Like if you, if you look at the history of diets throughout the world and if you look at any of the blue zones, um, which are these like places around the world where people live to very long lives, like for the most part, these people are eating plant-based diets, like 90% plant-based with like a little bit of dairy, depending on where they are, a little bit of meat, depending on where they are in the world. And so it's really interesting to me that this very fun. So if you think, if you define veganism as like cold pressed juice and this kind of stuff, then it is definitely just because they cost $10 of juice. It's outrageous. (laughs) But if you define it as like rice and beans, which is what most people eat and any kind of starch like corn or potatoes or, wheat. Um, these are things that are the cheapest things. And so, you know, for the actual, in actuality, um, people subsist on those foods. We just don't think of them as vegan. Yeah. So I think in terms of elitism, absolutely. There's a sort of like, as some would, some people would call like the whole foods, veganism, sort of this idea that you only eat things that are like, you know, nut based cheeses and things that are quite expensive and luxury products. Um, but for the most part to be vegan in actuality, it's a lot cheaper. So this notion that, you know, if you live in a food desert in the U S like absolutely, it's hard to get things, but still potatoes, beans, a lot of the times things like bananas are a lot of the cheapest foods. And so, um, it's also an artificial pricing because in the U S there's a huge subsidies for mass produced meat. So first of all, we grow meat very cheaply because we mistreat animals and we like put antibiotics in them and we, genetically modify them so they grow a lot faster um and we you know inject cows every nine months to produce milk all of the time and we have all these like highly highly industrialized but if you're going to eat you know non sub like so so first of all so those like cheap meats and dairy products we've seen in stores are not actually that cheap they're mm. artificially cheap and second of all um there is no like you know, broccoli lobby or you know carrot ro- lobby but there are like meat lobbies and dairy Definitely. lobbies and yeah. Um, so the notion that it's elitist, I completely understand if people narrowly define it in a very narrow sense of like cold pressed juice and things like that. But in actuality, it's not, I mean, it is in the sense of a symbolically, right? So symbolically, this notion of like organic food, fruits and vegetables, like lean, tall, healthy bodies, this kind of stuff. It's very sort of like Instagram elitist. Mm. Um, so there is that, but in some ways, um, you know, it just makes it more desirable. So people might look down on it, but they also want to partake in it more. So I think that's interesting in terms of developing countries. Um, so, so, but I should just say one more thing in terms of what you said, you know, there's this Malthusian like idea that you can only 
you know, you can only follow certain diets if you have the luxury to choose what to eat. And that is absolutely true. So if you live in a society where, you know, you don't really have a choice in terms of what to eat, um, you're going to eat whatever you can get your hands on. But throughout the world, that primarily means vegan food. That primarily means like plant-based food. It doesn't mean like, oh, I only have access to pig, so I'm going to eat pig. Mm. Like it's typically just rice or beans. Yeah, meat is very much still, I mean, this couples perfectly with the, the, the you know the, the argument about the developing world is that meat is very much still a luxury in a lot of places and an almost you know aspirational food and it's almost an aspirational goal in, in some developing countries to to eat more meat it's a sign of you know westernization of your diet it's often synonymous with progress so this idea of yeah it's, it's almost the, the the complete opposite Absolutely. And the reason that it's that is because the U.S. has set a standard and all other countries tend to primarily to try to get to the same level. So China is a really good example. But China also pledged to cut their meat consumption by 50 percent by 2030 because they see that it's like completely unsustainable given like the pollution problems and dietary problems. And we can see a huge shift in the population health as people have moved towards cities and started to eat more of a Western diet like a traditionally Chinese diet is, you know, a lot of greens and mm. rice and people live very, very long and healthy. I mean, obviously they do back la- backbreaking labor, which doesn't help, but they <laughs> start getting things like diabetes and things like that when they, when they can afford to eat meat. So it's actually a really unfortunate trend um, in the developing world because we just cannot sustain that kind of development, uh, that sort of that kind of meat production. Um, and we set a really terrible standard for the rest of the world, in my opinion, in the U.S., um, but I mean, there's just going to be limits to that. There's just like a certain, there's just like a earth lo- limit yeah. to that. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to reverse the trend before like our oceans are completely empty and, you know, our Amazon rainforest um, doesn't die. But I don't know. I'm <laughs> trying have to, to be remain hopeful. optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but that's my opinion. I do think that it's, Veganism is something that is primarily Western, just in the sense that in a Western context, we're just richer. And so we're able to have more of a choice about how to consume. That goes back to why I personally do it 100 percent, too, because I recognize that I have to compensate for people who might not be able to do it. Yeah, that we can afford to and that and that really we don't have an excuse. Um, You know, we're spoiled. We have the knowledge, too. We're rich in knowledge, which some people aren't necessarily. Yeah. So how do you I mean. I know we're both skeptics, but how do you, in the long term, um, you know, what's what do you see happening to to veganism, not just in your in 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 France, Israel, and and um, in the United States, but just I mean, guess what's next for veganism? Um, it's such an important question that I try to answer in my professional work and in my personal work. Um, you know, there is this notion actually that for any given trend to become very popular has to reach like the threshold of 10% of the population. And then it kind of like leaks into the mainstream. Like an example would be smoking, like veganism is often compared to smoking. So, um, as you know, the WHO classified processed meat as a carcinogen in the same class as cigarettes. So that doesn't mean that it's as carcinogenic. What it means is essentially that, um, you know, that we, there's a lot of the evidence, the level of evidence that it's carcinogenic is the same as it was for, you know, the the link between smoking and lung cancer. So we definitely know that, um, you know, even the WHO has said that it's, it's unhealthy. So people have started to cut back for the most part, though, people have just started to cut back red meat, you know, Mm. and then sort of moving toward like chicken and fish. I think a lot of people are sort of part-time vegans or flexitarian vegan-ish. So I do see those trends continuing continuing to 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 move. And in particular, if I mean, I don't want to be an, an economist for a second, but I think that if the supply, like if the demand changes, then the supply will change. So if there's, we see this already happening with like the dairy industry, like the alternative types of milk, like made yeah. out of peas or um, seeds or nuts and things like that. So if that trend continues and there are more people who want kind of vegan products um, compared to non-vegan products, we already see like companies like Tyson or like dairy companies like already like already trending in that direction. Like they're opening up research divisions within Tyson to like invest in plant-based meat and like lots of investors like Bill Gates, for example, Mm -hmm. just invested in Beyond Meat. 
you know, so there's definitely people see plant-based as the future. So I do think from like sort of, it looks like that veganism is sort of like jumping onto the, onto the train of capitalism. And if we know anything about the train of capitalism, like <laughs> it will go very fast, and very far. And if there is money be a train to be wreck. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but if there's money to be made, like the trend will continue, I That's think. True. Um, so I, I do think that it's happening in that, in that direction, but in terms of like human progress, and I'll return back to Yuval Harari here, because one thing that sapiens really makes obvious is that, you know, humans change things, but they don't necessarily progress. So <laughs> we do it with a lot of like, you know, people who are disadvantaged, leaving people, a lot of dis- people disadvantaged in our wake. And he has this whole like section on how we treated animals in the process of of developing and industrializing. So uh, I just don't believe in like a linear trend of human Mm. progress, you know, like in some ways, yes, we've eradicated certain illnesses and like these kinds of things, but we've created a lot of problems too. Like we've actually like managed to populate the entire world and, you know, destroy the planet in the meantime. So if we survive that in some way, and I do think that addressing our food issues, which is not um, just specific to veganism, but just in general, like food security, like we, um, we need to be able to feed the glowing world population. I think plant-based diets are like absolutely central to that and climate change. So I personally, as like a millennial quote unquote, you know, I see like two issues. One is the environment and the other is like the world population. And yeah. neither of those issues can be, those are the issues of our generation. Like I can't do anything, but think about those things because those are the issues of our generation. And you know, I do think food is a huge component of that. So there's a lot of other things we have to think about, like public health, disease, things like that. But I just think food is just like this completely, it's starting to become central, but, you know, I just think it's unbelievable to me that we can have like political discussions today and not talk about these things openly. Um, Obviously, I'm not even going to like hope that the current American president will think about these things. But even like reasonable people, (laughs) like maybe McLaughlin will, who knows. But like people in power, like for the most part, don't think about these things. And I just Mm -hmm. find that like absolutely ludicrous. That's the case. So hopefully over time, like with documentaries and things like that and like actual real science being done on this, we can make more progress. But um, I think I think it's moving in that direction. I just don't know. If it'll be quick enough. (laughs) Quick enough, essentially, yes. And and humans have this unfortunate tendency to do things when they're too late mm-hmm. and sort of not do things preventatively. Um, we're great at pro- procrastinating. Yeah, we really are. But I personally think that, you know, if I can follow, you know, I was vegetarian many, for many years, and then I just realized that um, a lot of the reasons I was vegetarian uh, made sense for veganism. And for me, it was like, it was a difficult transition. Like, I definitely love like fromage and everything you know in france i love that um but then i just got to a point where i was like you know it was easier to do it than it was not to do it if that makes mm. sense because i just yeah. knew too much and then it just became easier to do it 100 percent than to kind of make exceptions and i kind of thought like if if i can not only survive but actually thrive on a diet that minimizes the impact on animals and minimizes the impact on the environment, even though it's not a perfect solution to those things, um, then it just seemed like I had to do everything in my sort of professional and personal life to address that, those issues. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Nina, it's been, it's been great having you on the show. Do you have any last words of wisdom for listeners out there maybe maybe hopeful words i know we're both skeptics at heart and i know it's difficult at times but as a vegan and me i guess as an aspiring vegan slash skeptical vegetarian which are kind of opposing forces um what what would you say to listeners out there well i would say um so i'm going to say a couple of more professional things i'll say more personal things so from a professional perspective i think that um there's there's like, this is a very, this actually should be a hopeful thing because for, especially for like younger people. And this is why I started this group in Boston called Boston Plant-Based Millennials. And I also, um, am the president of Harvard Vegan Society and also ran the Ivy League Vegan Conference last year, because I actually think that this is like, these are the world issues to solve today and someone needs to solve them. And so I'm particularly interested in talking to younger people because millennials are absolutely driving this trend. And so it's actually a hopeful thing. Like people actually today there's a very clear thing that they can contribute to. 
like if they don't know how to like do something for the world, this is a very clear field to get into. And then it's a very easy we need field people, to get into. Very easy field, and it's very broad because we need people who are software engineers, biomedical people, doctors, um, you know, sociologists, I guess, you know, all types of people. So whatever your like particular interest in is, I think this is a social cause worth fighting for. And so this is a really cool thing to do. You know, this is a, a thing that really needs to be done for like our own sakes and for like the future sakes of humanity. And so it's just, it's really, I think, you know, my work has never been more exciting than when it's like been attached to this like passion. Like I used to be someone with a lot of enthusiasm, but without a passion. And that was very frustrating because I always mm-hmm. needed something like bigger to contribute to. And this is like a bigger drive. And so I wanted to mention also that I'm starting with one of the co-organizers of the Ivy League Green Conference named Phaedra Randolph. We're starting a vegan uh, tech conference. So we actually think that there's so much to be done in terms of like revolutionizing technology that we use either in agriculture or even just using AI, like, um, you know, artificial intelligence to figure out how to like create products that will taste exactly like dairy milk, but mm. use plant-based sources. Like there's so much, like, I think this is like a totally unscratched surface. Like it's just the beginning. And so that's a really fun thing to do. And we literally need people who specialize in absolutely every kind of area of expertise. Mm. So that's a really, you know, fun thing. And in terms of the personal side, I would just say that, it's so rewarding. Like I would have never, if someone had told me I'd be vegan even three years ago, I would not believe them. Like I just, I was vegetarian, but I was, you know, really loved France and really loved cheese. And I just didn't, you know, I, I, couldn't, imagine, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine a life without it. But the exciting thing is that it's like the most, it's actually the most painless and like the most delicious journey because you realize like you're just, it's really like actually kind of freeing to feel like you're not contributing as much to like the bad things in the world. And maybe I'm a little deluded because there's a lot of things I'm sure that I'm doing that are still impacting the world in negative ways, but it's just really nice to feel this like more synergy, more harmony with like the bigger kind of purpose of the world and other beings and other animals. And you'd be really surprised about the people you impact. Like I've definitely impacted like at least a hundred people on a personal level, Mm -hmm. um, over two years. Like, and I never even really did it completely consciously, you know, it's just, it's amazing because this is an issue that everybody can relate to. And, you know, if they want to just dip their feet in or they want to like jump fully into the ocean, um, it's doesn't really matter. The point is that, um, people, it's really fun to see people actually, you know, as a sociologist, social norms are so ingrained and it's very satisfying to see social norms start to change, you know, because they're so highly institutionalized and highly taken for granted that it's really nice. But I think humanity is like as much as I'm very skeptical, I think humanity is capable of amazing things. And so hopefully, hopefully this will be one of our less embarrassing moments in history. (laughs) (laughs) What a great way to finish off. Hopefully it'll be one of our less embarrassing moments. I love it. Mateo, this is such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you so much for being on this, uh, on this podcast. I feel like there's so many more issues we can discuss and and maybe at a later date definitely when you're further along in your dissertation we can have a uh a 2.0 uh, an episode 2 and and delve further into some of your research and and veganism yeah. and where it's going absolutely it would be such, such a pleasure a year from now hopefully i will have uh started this conference and finished a lot of my work on my field work so we should absolutely talk again thank you so much great Maybe we can speak in French next time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> French is not good enough. <laughs> no, me neither. Nope. What can happen? If you'd like to find out more about Nina and the work she's doing and what she's up to, you can check out the descriptions in the link below. Of course, all the material that we covered will also be found in the description below. All the sources, all the books, and a couple of YouTube videos. In next week's episode, we'll be talking all about why Crop diversity is humankind's most important natural resource. We talk about how saving seeds through seed banks scattered all around the world are just absolutely vital if we want to stand a chance of fighting climate change and being prepared at whatever nature might be throwing at us in the coming decades. I talked to Dr. Kerry Fowler, the father of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, about the importance of preserving this diversity. Extinction is is not an event. Uh, it's a process. It's not when the last individual of whatever dies. It's when um, 
that species loses the ability to evolve. And how does a species lose the ability to evolve? Well, it loses it by losing diversity. Um, and so if you keep diversity alive, you keep options alive, and those options are what a species, including our food crop species, uh, will need in the future to, to evolve. Be sure to tune in next week for that episode. That's it for now, guys. Thanks for tuning in this week. If you like this week's episode or any other episode that you've listened to in the past, the best way you can support the podcast is by liking, rating, and reviewing the show on iTunes. You can also follow the show on our Facebook page, Twitter page, and Instagram page. Our social media handle for all of those channels is at for food's sake me. You can also stream the episodes live from our website at www.forfoodsake.me. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you soon.